got him. That boy, he, he wasn't at all. Right. I did him. Yeah. No, not your side, but he's good. You got your one. That, that's all that matters. Alright. Fish landing violation. Now, now you can hold one. Heck yeah! Alright. There we go. Nice. Alright, alright. Hey! <laughs> nice. Well, get those life vests, zipped and clips, strap down those rods, and stash away those tackle bags because we are going fishing. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Bass Tour Anglers podcast. I hope this episode finds you with five for 25 in your live well. I'm your host, Keith Nicewander. Today, we continue with our content from the Gunnersville Writers Conference as we sit down with Mark Daniels Jr. But first, if you like the content we produce in this channel, please hit the subscribe button. We are building our viewership and your follow means a lot to us. We'd also love to hear from you, so leave us a comment. Let us know what you want to see. By now, I'm sure you know that we are the Western representatives for ducket fishing, pro-driven rods, reels, and baits. Quality that meets and exceeds all the brands on the market at prices that must be seen to be believed. How come you've never heard of them? You just did. Find out about the Ducket lineup of pro-driven products by going to ducketfishing.com. At the Lake Gunnersville Riders Conference, it was three days of bass fishing 24-7. Breakfast, then fishing. Lunch, then fishing. Dinner, then after dinner. We were fully immersed with some of the top bass pros in the world. I was able to pull Mark Daniels Jr. aside and he shared a really neat story with us. From Delta Rat to BPT Tour Pro, I think you're going to enjoy what he has to say. Gunnersville Writers Conference, uh, we are here with Mark Daniels Jr., Major League Fishing Bass Pro Tour Pro, uh, among other things. Ding Squad member. Yes, sir. Uh, are we calling it Ding Squad? What are we calling it? Nah, it's, you know, just a ding crew. A ding crew, or you know, whatever you want to call it. As long as you throw Ding in there, everybody know who you're talking about, man. <laughs> yes, it's yes, us. yes, they do. Yes, yeah, they do. So no many doubt. things. So many things. We'll definitely want to talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, let's talk about your beginning uh, from the, the yeah. Bay Area. Uh, would you call yourself, are you a Delta rat, or how do you, how man, do you classify yourself? I'm definitely a Delta rat, man. Okay. For sure. I mean, I have been my whole life. I've been fishing at Delta. Man, I can't even remember when I didn't, you know. <laughs> um, my first tournament, my first fish on a lure, um, all my first beginnings and all my experiences in the beginning of my fishing career from a, you know, from a, a little, little kid all took place on a California Delta. So anything associated with it, man, I, you know, I just love, you know, all the way to the core, man. So, so, so when you talk about your fishing fundamentals and what you – 
what you lean on and, and the way you read, cover, things like that, it is from your experience on the Delta. Initially, initially, yeah. So, you know, I've been I've been out here on tour now for, this is my ninth season, mm -hmm. um, which is crazy. I feel like I was just at home, you know, hanging out with the boys at Russo's Marina, you know, last week. But um, I've been out here for nine years, man, and so much has evolved in fishing since then. And I have evolved so much as an angler since then. But yes, my initial experience is coming out on tour or just fishing new bodies of water. I look through the Delta goggles I'm gonna call it as I the way I approach everything, mm -hmm. and um, you know it could be that was a gift and a curse all in, all in one. So that's how we started out. So when we come to a lake like Gunnersville, uh, this is this is my first experience on this lake. I live in Southern California, and I see so much bank cover. Yeah, yeah. That if I had a sliver of this bank cover to fish. Oh, I would no. be on it all the time. I know. And I have not had, and I fished with several pros this week. Not one person has taken me to no. a boathouse uh, or a bank. Right. I'm seeing that red, that red clay bank and the lay down. None of that. Looks like primo it, it, it habitat, does. right? And, and it is. It's got a whole At things. certain times of the year. Yeah. You know, so we're here on the TVA, the, the Tennessee Valley Association or whatever it stands for, something along those lines. The Tennessee River, man. Yeah. And it's summertime. It's 100 degrees every day we've been here. And that only means one thing when you're on the Tennessee River. Offshore, man. To some degree. You don't have to necessarily be fishing deep. You don't necessarily have to be fishing um, hard bottom. There's grass. There's shell bars. There's all sorts of things going on. But it's all current related, which mm -hmm. takes place off the bank. So that's, that's what you've experienced so far this week. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so what year did you, let's talk about coming, coming east. You live now in Alabama. Yep. I live in Alabama. And I'm, I'm assuming that move, uh, came as, as a result of wanting to continue and increase your, your tour presence. Uh, what year was that? And, and, and what, what was the, what was the decision that made, you made to do that? Yeah. So, uh, that all happened. So I won the, I won the TBF national championship in 2013. Uh, I made the big move in January of 2014, quit my job, me and my family moved cross country to Alabama to chase the dream, man, as so many guys have, have, have done over the years. Um, at that point in my career, it just wasn't a, a smart financial decision to try to stay in California and pursue this dream. It just wasn't going to happen. Just too expensive, cost of living, travel, etc. It was just too much of a burden. So what we did was... Uh, we just moved to Alabama. Now, my wife's from Alabama. We met in college. I graduated from Tuskegee University in 2006. And so, and she's from Tuskegee. So it was a very natural transition yeah. for us to leave California and literally just move back to her hometown um, where we would have help with our children at the time. They were really young and, and all of that and kind of set up shop to work out of. And I was really close, man. I mean, in Alabama where I'm at, for the most part, I'm always within about a 10 hour drive with the exception of New York yeah. or somewhere up north we go every year. So like Michigan, Wisconsin, New York, but that's just one trip out of the year. So yeah. that's what fueled the decision to move east to where we could be in a better financial place and yet I could still chase the dream. Very good, yep. very good. Now, uh, next big decision. I mean, I'm sure there's been other big decisions, but <laughs> 2000, 2019 was it is a big year for the sport. Oh, for uh, sure. Whether you, you know, I mean, there are positives and negatives, but uh, yeah, I had to make that decision yeah. to leave BASS and come to Major League Fishing. Uh, what, what was that like for you? Very, very difficult for me. Um, you know, I, I had fished FLW three years prior. That was my entry level to professional bass fishing. I fished on FLW side for three years, as did many of us. Um, but there was always that uh, pressure to get over there and to compete on the Bassmaster Elite Series because you had the biggest names over yeah. there. Kevin was there, Edwin was there, Skeet. The list is super long. They were all there. Now, we had our superstars too, don't get me wrong, Absolutely. on the FLW side. These guys are crazy good, right? But Bass was getting all the notoriety. And so it was like, you wanted to compete at the top of the game, you need to get over there. So. Just like everybody else, man, I put all my money in them opens. 
and I fish simultaneously FLW Tour and the Bassmaster Opens, and I qualify for the Elite Series. Uh, in, 20, in 2016 is when I qualified. My rookie year on the Elite Series was 2017. And so my career over there was very short-lived because I only competed on the bass side for two years. So I didn't have a lot of those negative experiences as some of the guys that have been doing this yeah. for years. Kevin yeah. Edwin, you know, Timmy Horton, all these guys, right? They've been fishing bass their whole career. So they have this relationship. I didn't really have a lot. In my two years, I had a great experience, man. I won a big event my second year. Um, I made the classic both years. Things were looking great for me. Sponsorship dollars were looking good. I was having a great time. It was just all good. And so, uh, you know, I, I didn't really have anything bad to say. So to make the decision to jump over to Major League Fishing was, was hard for me. And it was a little concerning. Um, it's like I worked my whole career to get where I'm at right now. And now I'm just going to break off and leave. But you start talking to guys, like all these names I just yeah. listed, and they're all leaving. Like without a – they're not second-guessing anything. Mm -hmm. They're like, I'm out. 100% I'm out. And I'm like, well, dang. If the biggest names in the game are leaving, what am I to do? You know, I don't – I want to fish against the best, all of the best. And, and that includes everyone who – got an invitation to major league fishing and that did not because once you make it to this level you're a great angler in my, in my opinion and so i want to fish against the best right well 80 percent of the best left yeah. and i was fortunate enough to get an invitation so what was i to do to sit back no i want to compete against the best and i like the i like the uh um the storyline that they pitched what they were wanting to do you know, I was already a fan of Major League Fishing from watching the Cups, you know, and so that was my decision. Very hard decision for me, though. Very, very difficult. How about the format? The format is completely different than what any of us grew up in bass tournaments with. I mean, I mean, really, if this format had been in place back in, with Ray Scott, bass boats might not have live wells. I know, it. that's true. You, you know? Yeah, no, it's definitely. I mean, that's funny you say that. Well, a lot of people like that. You know, a lot of bass fishermen, let me throw this out there a little a lot of bass are the misconception. A lot of people eat bass, yeah. Just for and there's nothing wrong with that, might I add. Um, but people just get all crazy about it. But anyways, yeah, they may not have live wolves. So, so that format does it? Oh, the format does it change? Does it change the way you fish? So the format is the most difficult part about it all. Yeah. Um, yes, it does change the way you fish. It changes the way you think. It changes the way to practice. It changes. It changes everything. Um, but I feel like w with it all, it makes you a better angler because you never stop evolving. You're never safe. You can never get comfortable. Um, you never have a break. It, it's just, it's, it's full on game the entire time. Whereas in a five fish tournament that we all love and I still love myself and I will still fish five fish tournaments. Um, you know, you go out and crack 20 pounds in the first hour. You kind of easing around the rest of the day. Like, Sandwich time. Yeah, man. I had a good day, <laughs> and especially if you know the fishery, right? So, like, I'll use the California Delta. We're going to up that a little bit to 25 pounds, yeah. and it happens. Sometimes you'll go out, you catch 25 pounds in the first couple hours. Phenomenal day, right? Rest of the day, I'm not going to go jacking on none of more of my spots, none of my fish, none of that. I'm going practicing at the very best, Yeah. right? You never can do that in Major League Fishing. Right. Never. You know, it's interesting. We we always talk about. It. I got I got a, I got a limit. Yeah. There's no yeah. limits. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. So that's that's one of fishermen's favorite saying. Well, I got, I got a limit. I got a limit. Nah. No, you didn't. <laughs> you better you better keep you better go back you better go back digging that bag again. Like it just never stops, man. And so what it's done is, it makes you work harder on the water during a tournament. Yeah. Because you may run all your spots and boom. You ran dry, you caught whatever you caught, but you're still 10 pounds outside the cut or whatever it is. Now you're immediately back in practice mode trying to figure it out again. And then the next day is the same. And then and then you qualify to the next round and everybody goes back to zero. Then you gotta do it all over again. Very difficult, man. And a lot of people underappreciate how difficult it is because they've never done it. And I'll be the first one to tell you, and I'm just gonna be straight up, it is much harder than your traditional five fish tournament 
on your mental, on your body, on your drive, on everything, because it never stops from the time they say go until the time is lines out with the exception of your two 15 minute breaks. As a fan, there's there's certain points during the week of a, of a, of a BPT tour event that mm -hmm. I, I don't want to miss. I don't want to miss the uh, the uh, top 20 right. on either of those second days. Right, Because right. that 20, that, that 20, 20 spot, cut. Yeah, man. <laughs> it's hairy there. Stress. I don't want to miss the eight cutoff on, on the knockout round. Knockout round. Yep. And then, you know, championship day uh, is crazy. Two weeks ago, we watched uh, Ryan Ryan Salzman and, and yeah. Jacob Wheeler. That I that was Battle that out. third period was nuts. That was crazy, man. I mean, you could not turn it. Once you turn that on, you can't turn it off. I, I absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm the same way, man. I'm watching that second for second, blow for blow, and it it's just so crazy. And in those, they had to catch 1.8s, and how many 1.5s and sixes did they catch? Fifteen inch man. fish were not measuring a pound and a half because they're spawned out, and it's you know. Spawn. Yep. Yeah. It's unbelievable, man. Uh, and that's the thing. That just adds all onto the stress. You may go out, ah, oh, man, mm -hmm. only, uh, I caught 10 bass today, scoreables. Well, really, you caught 35, but only 10 of them scored. Yeah. Well, in your traditional tournament, you could bring all them in. Right. You know, or you can cull through them or whatever. We don't even get to fake keep them for a little bit. Yeah. It's just, nope, you don't make it, boom. Here's a, here's a question that I've always wanted to ask somebody. I always forget to ask them, but. I know the tournament officials set the 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 size limit or the weight limit, weight limit yeah. at the beginning of an event. How did how what what make how, what criteria do they use for that? Somebody so, out there fishing or what's going? No, on? No, they uh, they actually work with the wildlife or the uh, like you know like fishing game for whatever particular body of water that is to figure out what the average size keeper in that lake is, and then they vary it on that. So there's actually some bit. there's actually some science yeah and so they'll go pull the data from you know uh texas fish and wildlife for example and all right the average keeper in whatever lake is this so then they'll go okay then we definitely need to roll with a two pound minimum yeah or if we go to like travis right or watts bar right and they get with the tva association whoever handles the fish and wildlife here and then they're like no the average fish is a one point nine maybe or something all right yeah. and we can do a one eight right just barely above that but before we were fishing for with a one pound minimum and that's just too many small fish on any fishery yeah and so it just doesn't work so a pound and a half given the fishery is super challenging now when you were pre-fishing for that watts bar event mm -hmm. uh did you catch some 16 15 inches and and measure them or did you just say oh these are these are going to be okay no I, I weigh every single one of my fish in practice yeah when i catch them because i need to know i want to get my eyes trained on what he looks like yeah. what a keeper looks like i need to know just what they're weighing given the time of year like you said we rolled in there right after they got done spawning mm -hmm. they're post spawn they're probably at the lightest they'll be yeah you know through the year so that makes it really difficult but knowing that definitely helps you out as far as spot selection things like that so yeah i'm weighing every one of them had to be a couple times when you caught a couple of those 15 15 inches and looked at it and, oh 1.3 oh I, dude I, I weighed i was embarrassing myself at watch bar because it was so tough and my my vision got off to where non-keepers was looking like keepers and i'm like I well got, a 15 I inch try. bass should weigh two pounds Tr traditionally it yeah should weigh it two should. pounds yeah looking at these suckers <laughs> bringing them close putting them up i'm like this sucker got away let's bring me the scale bring the scale slap him on there one point one pound three ounces no. i'm like one three you ain't even close Jeez. you know but that's part of the game but i caught a couple big ones too so that that always helps well, Mark, I appreciate your time today. Oh, yes, sir. And, yes, sir. And, uh, you know, the, you've been on my list of guys that to try to, to try to get with. Yeah, very, man. Very busy. You when got I me. saw you were going to be here, I thought, yes. You got, got me. Got him. So got thanks me. for being with uh, us. Not a problem. And, right. hey, sorry for crashing the last podcast with Cajun Baby, but, hey, sometimes you got to <laughs> do it like that. That's what makes it exciting, man. You that, never know. Uh, that's going to be a whole segment by itself. There you go. Yes, sir. That's you. awesome. <laughs> right on. All right. Thank you. Yeah, yes, sir. You're welcome. Whether it be YouTube content or as a professional tour pro, Mark Daniels Jr. is one of the really fun guys out there. He's energetic. He's got a great personality. He'll talk to anybody, talk to me. And he's somebody that just has got a lot going for him. I hope you liked hearing from Mark. He has got a lot of good things to say. 
And we've got a lot more content coming that involves Mark Daniels Jr. He he covered a lot of stuff in our discussion with him. Way too much for one episode. Until next time, keep both hands on the wheel and be safe.